in this week's all new episode of Sports Path. The winter season is wrapping up and the winter sports have come to a close. We've got postseason basketball highlights as well as some state tournament hockey right around the corner on this all new episode. So stay tuned as we lead you down the Sports Path. Good evening, everybody. We are coming to you live here on SEC TV. As you can tell, I'm here all by myself tonight. Sam, on the other hand, has his hands full, assistant coaching baseball for White Bear Lake. Uh, hopefully, he can give us some inside scoop of the program for the upcoming spring season. Uh, but before we get started, a quick programming note. This will be our last episode of the winter season. All of our Fab Four teams have wrapped up postseason play. So with that, we look ahead to the spring season. And if you have looked outside lately, there's still a lot of snow on the ground. So it might be a while before we get out to any of those spring games. And uh, officially, the start of the beginning of April is when games will start, depending on the weather. So our first episode of the spring will be the third Wednesday of April. We are, in fact, skipping the first Wednesday, but don't forget to catch us on that third Wednesday of April. All right, now let's get you guys back to tonight's show. Let's reel it back just a little bit. Lots of highlights for you guys here tonight. Basketball and hockey seasons have wrapped up, but let's get the show started as we always do with the social media montage. Now on tonight's social media montage, we bring you just a couple of tweets, starting with one from the Matamidi boys basketball team. Matamidi plays in the Section 4 3A tournament every year, and we've had, or they've had success in the past year. They ended up playing Totino Grace in the 4 3A semifinals. The game went into overtime where Javon Hadley scored the game-winning basket with the tip in. We don't have the highlights of that one, unfortunately, uh, for that game, but Matamidi ended up advancing to the championship game where they tipped off against Columbia Heights for the second year in a row, and we actually have those highlights in the rematch of one year later, so don't go anywhere. Uh, now next, we have a tweet coming from North Activities account where it looks like the North St. Paul Pep Band was on the big stage. They ended up securing a gig to play for the Colgate Women's Hockey uh, Tournament in the 2000 NCAA Women's Frozen Four and at the University of Minnesota. And Colgate faced off against Clarkson in an overtime thriller. Unfortunately, Colgate did not come up with the win, but I'm sure that was definitely not because of the North Polar Prep Band. It looks like the Pep Band certainly enjoyed that experience, and we know the Colgate women's hockey team did too. They tweeted out a thank you uh, following the game. Uh, what an experience it had to be for the high school Pep Band getting to go on the big stage. Band director Mr. Hammerman over at North St. Paul is always doing big things to make sure his band has the best high school experience. And with that, we wrap up another edition of Social Media Montage. All right, now with the social media montage out of the way, let's get right into winter sports now. Girls hockey has wrapped up quite a while ago, and if you remember the Section 4 single A, uh, Matamidi was seeded third and knocked out by South St. Paul in the semifinals, losing 5-3. to three. St. Paul United ended up representing the Section 4 single A in the state tournament and four and in the 4-2A, three Fab Four schools in that tournament ended up playing each other in the quarterfinals. North and Tartan are combined for girls hockey. They were seeded sixth and ended up playing the number three seed Wiper Lake in the first round. Wiper Lake advanced all the way to the championship where they took on familiar opponent Hill Murray. They met their match in that one in the finals, losing to Hill Murray four to nothing. So that's girls hockey. Let's jump over to boys hockey, starting with four. 2A. Now, if we look in the 4-2A boys hockey tournament, White Bear Lake got the number one seed, and it really looked like it was going to be their year. You know, they beat Hill Murray early on, and they beat Tartan uh, this year in the semifinals. And after getting upset uh, last year by the Titans in, in the championship game, they took on Hill Murray 
just like the girls, we've got the full broadcast on our YouTube channel, so you can check it out there. Uh, but what it really came down to was an all too familiar experience for the White Bear Lake Bears. They lost to Hill Murray Pioneers in yet another four 2A championship game. So good luck to the Bears. They'll maybe, maybe they'll make it to the state tournament next year, but that's their familiar foe is the Hill Murray Pioneers. Now we'll take it to the Class A state bracket. Last episode, we were able to get you guys the highlights of the first round matchup of the Class A bracket of the state tournament, where Matamidi beat Mankato East 4-2. And since the game was only two weeks ago, we'll show, show you guys the highlights of this one as well. And we'll take you to the XL Energy Center. No blonde hair this year for the Zephyrs. Midway through the first period, Joe Paradise nets an even strength goal. He gives Matamidi the lead. One to nothing in the early going. Now two goals uh, for East in the second, and at the start of the third, a fan and block shot leads to another Joe Paradise goal, tying it up at two. Now late in the third, still tied at two. East gets called for a boarding five-man advantage for the Zephyrs, and this would really swing the game in the Zephyrs' direction. They're one man up now, and Zephyrs score within two or with two minutes remaining to give them the lead, three to two. Now, Matamidi looking to seal the deal. They'll end up getting a wraparound goal by who else but Corey Polarski for a final score of four to two. And if you remember last season, Matamidi all dyed their hair blonde in hopes of making the hockey hair team a popular YouTube segment after the state tournament, highlighted by John Butchagross himself over at ESPN. At the post-game conference, the team addressed the blonde hair and why they didn't do it for the section tournament this season, but whatever they did really worked in the state tournament. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> We're here to play hockey this week. <laughs> well, uh, this team has shown uh, grit all season. Um, from day one, uh, we were down two goals to Hill Murray in our opening game back in uh, December 5th. Uh, going into the third period, and uh, and they battled back against you know uh, a good Hill Murray team, and um, they, they've just shown that kind of uh, resiliency and resolve. Um, and as a coach, it's it's just a, a pleasure to be a part of because on the bench there's no there's no quit, there's no panic. It's okay, let's get to work and let's get this taken care of. We've been in high pressure situations in the past couple of weeks. A couple of times uh, we, we were down one to Northfield in the semis with three, four minutes ago, and Singley had us, they were beating us for a while. So we're, that's good that we went through that. So we were kind of prepared for that. And we, we just kind of took a deep breath and played hockey. Um, you know, any team that wins their last three games to come out of their section is, is coming in riding high and uh, are confident. And any time you play a confident team, you're going to be in for a battle. Uh, and so I, I expect the, the other games to be uh, competitive as well. Um, and uh, you know, it, it should be a great tournament. And, and we're glad to, to uh, move on. All right, now let's look back at that Class A state tournament bracket. As you can see, Matamida is taking on Orono in the first round. They beat Litchfield, Litchfield on a 6-1 to victory, just absolutely blowing them out. Let's see how Matamida would fare against this number three Orono seed. And actually, we have the highlights for you right here. So we'll take you to the Class A quarterfinals. Once again, at the XL Energy Center. And late in the first period, Danielle Eckerline shoots the puck from the blue line. It's redirected by Thomas Walker, giving Orono a one to nothing lead. And now about a minute later, Davey Burns centers the puck to Eckerline. Eckerline shoots and scores, making it a two to nothing game at the end of the first period. Orono starting out this game absolutely on fire. As you can see, the crowd's just going crazy right there. They got all the momentum on their side. Now, early in the second period, Orono would end up making it three to nothing. Another goal from Thomas Walker. That's two for him now on a three on two breakaway. It leads to an early goal in the second period. Things are really looking bad for Matamidi now. As I said, the momentum is all on Orono's side. The crowd's going nuts, and it just gets worse. Jack Schuessy gets by the puck on the far boards. He fires it in. Thomas Walker is there once again. For the redirect, it gives Walker's third goal for the hat trick. Four goals total for Orono and zero for Matamidi. Let's see if Matamidi can come back in this one. 
Matabidi eventually goes on the power play a short time later. A puck shot by Charlie Bartholomew gets redirected by Sam Aid, giving Matamidi their first goal of the game, 4-1. to one. Or no, Matamidi gets their first points. You got to start somewhere, right? Now Corey, Corey Polarski goes on a breakaway on the far side. He plays it up the far side and shoots the puck himself. That's an unassisted goal from Polarski, making it a 4-2 to two game. It's only a two-goal difference now, and the Zephyrs have some fire. You see the Matamidi crowd, they, they represent well. We've seen them a long time here at the Fat Four. Now Joe Paradise from Matamidi grabs the puck from Orono early in the third period over to Bartholomew and across to Aiden Pearson to make it a one goal game. Pearson puts another goal on the score sheet. Matamidi is only down by one goal now. Now Orono letting their foot off the gas. Corey Polarski takes the puck in himself just a couple minutes later. Can't put the puck in, but the fourth liner, Jeff Neal, gets the rebound for the tie game. Four goals apiece. And this one is turning into a, a hockey game, folks. It's all tied up now at 4-4. Four four. The Matamidi crowd going nuts. Coach Poschel is trying to tell his players how to stay in it and stay hyped up in this one, how to stay focused. Now, early in the overtime period, puck behind the net is controlled by Orno. They get it up for a top shot. Save made, but the puck is still loose. Davey Burns jams it in. Pup Pox and Dave Corsi bats the puck into the net. And that's all, folks. Orono wins it 5-4 in overtime. A beautiful goal by Corsi. Jeff Poschel addressed the media after the game of this one. Couldn't be more proud. Uh, couldn't be more proud. Uh, I don't know if there's many other teams in the state that wouldn't have been down by four and folded up their tents and packed it in. And so uh, there's no... No way to describe how proud I am. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, from the you know from the very beginning of the year, we if we were down by a goal or two, it wasn't uh, wasn't panic time. It was t just time to go to work. And uh, this group never felt like they were out of a game. And um, you know, like Sam said, I think they really uh, covered for each other. They picked each other up. Uh, and resilience is is a good word. I mean. If you watch the game, there's there is absolutely zero for them to be ashamed of. Um, so we'll we'll remind them of that, and uh, and you know tomorrow's a big game too. It's you know you're you're playing in, at the XL Energy Center uh, for a third place game, and uh, and and so it, you know don't don't kid yourself. This one hurts, uh, and and uh, they left their heart and soul on the ice and. Uh, it'll it'll take some time to just regroup and and get our get ourselves uh, together and, and and to a place where we can carry ourselves and and, uh, and uh, come out strong and, and play to win tomorrow. Success on the road of life. Dane Corsi. So that would be your score, five to four. Amanda Bidai would go on to play the third place game the next day, and Orono would go on to win the Class A state tournament bracket. They're your state championships of, or their state champions, excuse me. They beat Alexandria, the four seed, two to one. So what a great year by Orono, and Matamidai had a great year as well. Losing to the state champion is uh, no small feat. They definitely have a lot to hang their heads on, and you know they'll be right back at it next year. I have no doubt about it. All right, well, it's time to bring you guys a segment, you know, that we've done here once or twice in the past. Definitely not while I've been here, but it's uh, been a while. So let's start with, with a new edition uh, called Where Are They Now? In this edition of Where Are They Now, we want to highlight Jake Jackson. Jake Jansen, Jackson played hockey at Tartan High School from 2010 to 2013. Jake scored 15 goals as a forward in his first season, and he really grew from there. He ended up with the captain C on his jersey his senior year as a standout athlete on an otherwise average team. Jake would score multiple hat tricks in his senior season. Take a look at some of these highlights of games that we covered while he was at Tartan. He led the team with 29 goals, 27 assists for 56 points his senior year. Tartan ended up losing in the first round of the Section 4 2A tournament against Roseville. But it definitely was a game where Jake once again scored a hat trick, just putting the team on his back. And despite losing the first round of the sections, Jake was named finalist for the Mr. Hockey Award as a senior. And while at Tartan, Jake also committed to play for Michigan Tech in college at the Division I level, a very good school. And back in 2013, we interviewed Jake about committing to Michigan Tech. Um, looking uh, down the road, you look thinking about Michigan Tech at all? I mean, right now I'm just worried about the season here. That's why I stay back. I want to go down and uh, 
playing the tourney and then I mean next year I have Waterloo so that's a couple years down the road so I mean I'm really looking forward to it really excited to play college hockey but right now it's high school got a commitment to my team so Exciting news came in 2013 NHL entry draft. Jake Jackson was selected in the seventh round by the San Jose Sharks of the NHL. And after his last hockey game for Tartan, Jake actually went on to play baseball in the spring of his senior year. And after a short stint with the Waterloo Blackhawks of the UA USHSL, he skated with the Des Moines Buccaneers also of the USHL. Uh, for a full season in 2013 and 14. In 2014, Jake started the season with the Nanimo Clippers of the BCHL, and he finished third on the team with 54 points in 52 regular season games. He added eight goals and six assists in 22 playoff games of that year. And finally, in 2015, Jake went on to Michigan Tech. Now, he only played 11 games his freshman season, but during his sophomore season, he skated in 41 games, scoring 11 goals and adding six assists. He caught fire at the end of that season and scored the game-winning goal as a part of a three-point night in the WCHA playoff opener against Lake Superior State. He buried the second goal in the WCHA championship game that set Tech to the 2017 NCAA hockey tournament. Most recently, Jake Jackson is in his junior season at Michigan Tech. And during this year's WCHA playoffs, Jake scored both goals in a 2-1 win over Minnesota State in the semifinals. It was an overtime game winner that sent Michigan Tech on to the WCHA championship game back in Michigan uh, against in-state rival Northern Michigan University. Michigan did end up beating NMU for their second straight WCHA tournament championship, sending the Huskies to the NCAA tournament for the second year in a row. And that is where we leave you now. Michigan Tech plays second-seeded Notre Dame in the first round. That game is scheduled for Friday, March 23rd at 2 p.m. It will be broadcast on ESPN2, so this is a huge game if ESPN's covering hockey. So don't forget to flip on your TVs this Friday afternoon to catch a former Fab Four athlete pay, play in the NCAA tournament. Great things happening all over the Northeast Metro, but Jake Jackson is certainly one standout former athlete from Tartan. And that has been the most recent edition of something we're going to try to start doing of Where Are They Now? Now we're going to go to switch the little gears a little bit. We're going to go to girls basketball, uh, specifically the 4-3 a bat bracket. Last sports path, we showed you the Matamidi was set to compete in the section championship. They destroyed Columbia Heights in the first round, which we uh, displayed here on SEC TV. Uh, but we'll have their game against the De La Salle Highlanders uh, right now, where they went on to play in the championship. Matamidi starts off with a, over a minute possession, eventually giving the ball to Josie Underwood. Drano sinks the three. Seconds later, this might look a little bit like deja vu. Ball back to Underwood. She drains the three again. Six points in the early going in the first couple minutes for Josie Underwood. And now get this. Once again, Josie Underwood goes three for three from beyond the arc. 11 minutes to play. Matamidi is up 11 to seven over a very good De La Salle team. Now eventually De La Salle started to put on some full court pressure and that definitely did some damage. They tie it up at 19 with less than a minute to play off that layup. Less than a minute to play in the first half. Josie Underwood takes the ball on a fast break with 15 seconds. She'll take it all the way to the hoop, making it 21-19 with about 10 seconds left to play. Underwood having a heck of a game here in the section championship. Right back the other way, Dale South puts the ball for the buzzer, buzzer, buzzer beater. It rattles in then out, and Dale South almost takes their first lead of the game before halftime, but Matamidi goes in the second half leading. Now De La Salle starts the second half with a pass inside, a few dribbles, and now an amazing reversal layup ties the game at 21. Now De La Salle pressure carries over the second half as they take their first lead of the game off the steal off the inbounding ball. That's 23 to 21 now. Now De La Salle with a 10 point lead later on. Matabidi finally breaks the press. Long pass. Underwood adds to her total. She cuts the deficit to only eight now. Matabidi's got to get things going. Four minutes left to play. Now Matabidi gets the press. They get called for a foul. Something they can't have with only four minutes left in the game. Now chilling by five. Roadhouse will end up getting the ball at the top of the key. She has great range. Drano cuts this lead to only two points. 30 seconds left to play. Now it's a game of free throws. De La Salle hits six for six in the last 30 seconds of the game. Grothaus adding two for Matamidi, but that isn't enough. De La Salle upsets Matamidi for the second straight year in the 4-3A finals. And Matamidi is yet to make a state tournament appearance. Grothaus and the rest of the seniors had a great season, but it just didn't go their way in the end. That's a 47-41 final, and De La Salle represents the 4-3A in the state tournament once again.
All right, now we're gonna go to the 4-4A bracket. Taking a look at the 4-4A bracket, North St. Paul lost to Tartan in the first round. Uh, White Bear Lake took on, a, took on Tartan in a Fab Four playoff matchup, which once again we sold right here on SEC TV. Tartan came away with that win. So Tartan moved on to play one of the best teams in state in Creighton Durham Hall. Tartan really hung in there for most of the game and only lost by 10. Chevrolet put up 20 points. The sophomore will be looking to build off this playoff success. She's got her feet wet now and she'll be looking to get this team going places in her junior year. Now going to the boys basketball bracket for 3A. We'll see how Matamidi got to the section championship. Matamidi beat St. Paul Como Park pretty handily. And then they went on to play a very good Totino Grace team. And they won in that nail biter as we highlighted in the social media montage on the Jack, or on the Jack Shea tip in 83-81. Uh, Jack Shea led the team with 23 points in that one. Let's take you to a rematch of last year's section championship game. Matamidi lost to Columbia Heights last year. Can they get it done this year? Like we said, this is really just the rematch of last year's game. Can Matamidi break the barrier and get this one going in their direction and get that first to the target center? But just like last year, this one was close throughout. Early in the first, Timmy Linquist finds Hadley with the early entry pass. Hadley with the finish. He was the hero in Matamidi's semifinal win over Totino Grace. Columbia Heights has the need for speed, though, as DeAndre Robertson sees a lane, sprints up the road, gets the easy layup. Now Matamidi struggled against the Columbia Heights transition game. Kermoga Lair gets caught in a double team. Double team, he loses the ball. And Christian Kelly is off to the races. Quickness was the theme for the Highlanders all night. Now the Zephyrs trail by two late in the first half of the sharpshooter known as Lero. Will change that with the three from the wing. A great momentum builder there for Matamidi. And when he gets hot, he gets going. But Columbia Heights ended the half with a momentum killer under 30 seconds left. Lero loses the ball once again. And it's showtime for Robinson. He throws it down, one-handed jam. Highlanders take the 30 to 29 lead at halftime. Now the Zephyrs start the second half with a little transition flare. Good ball movement, sets up Jack Shade down low for the easy floater. The senior was one of three Zephyrs to score 14 points. Now big sequence here for the Highlanders. Quinton Hardrick finds Samir Davis, Davis on the skip alone. three ball, Balls corner out. pocket. Off the window, not an easy shot, folks. Columbia Heights goes back up 33-31. Highlanders bring the pressure off the inbound. Laro throws an errant pass to Robertson. He sets up an easy transition score for Hardrick, who passed his 1,000th career point in the semifinal round for Heights. Heights up by four now. Now, Matamidi refused to concede, however, as Linquist. Drano gets the three. Zephyrs cut the deficit to one, but the Highlanders hit the accelerator again. Hardrick with the dime to Kelly with the layup. Columbia Heights leads 56 or 55 to 52. They would extend that lead to five with under three minutes left, but the Zephyrs won't go away. Hadley kicks it out to an open Laro for three, and the senior makes it a two-point game. Bottom of the eye's got life. Laro actually hit four triples in that game, but however, just like last year, the Highlanders came up clutch in the end. Bottom of the Zach Centers loses the ball, tipped to Jarvis right. He finds Robertson for the leak out, and the senior goes in for the dagger. Robertson scored a game-high 19, and Columbia Heights once again, two years in a row, dances their way to the second straight section title. 70 to 62 is your final, and there's no, sh no shortage of jubilation. So Columbia Heights for the second straight year beats Matamidi, just a crushing blow. Matamidi, a very young squad. They'll look to build off this uh, lead next year, or build off this, this year and look to get better next year. Now looking at the 4-4A bracket, North took on Tartan in what was turning out to be quite the rivalry between these two teams. Me and Sam were on the call for that game. But without further ado, we'll take you to North St. Paul High School, where this one would be loud, folks. Both teams start out with magic behind the three-point arc. Langford Johnson hits one from downtown. But it wouldn't be long before Tartan answered back. Kimmins passes over to Kearney, gets the corner, answers back with a three of his own. That's for three, it's all tied up with 16.35 left to go. Now North St. Paul is pulling ahead midway through the first half. Daywan Carter, his signature NBA deep three, makes the lead 17-9 with only six minutes to play. Now Tartan creeps back into it with the nice drive. Andrew Jacobs Whitmore, he'll end up adding two points with a left-handed floater. 23-20 now. North St. Paul ends the first half the same way they started it, however, with a three-pointer. This one Titus Dean. Drano, so that's 26-20 at halftime. Let's go to the second half. This one will start off with good news. Capigal 
He would miss a three to start the second half, but who is it? Kale Golden is there to put it back in. He gets called for the foul and one. That turns into three points on the free throw, 29 to 20 now for North. Now trying to push the game out of reach by Tartan Titus Dean. Hits a wide open three right here, making it 47 to 38. A nine point game with less than six minutes to play. A minute later, Tartan starts off the run. Kimmins with a big offensive rebound. He puts it back in, making it a seven point game. Now McKeel Weems will end up making this one a five point game for Tartan as he finds he gets the bucket, draws the foul. Unfortunately, he'll miss the free throws, but nonetheless, Tartan's back in it. They got life, it's 47 to 42. Now Weems will shorten the lead even more. A three point game now after he goes up with it. Contested shot, gets the roll to go in. It's 47-44. Now Bryce Phillips struggling with the ball. Tartan comes up with a huge steal and Anton Kimmins rushes down the court. He misses the layup, but a foul is called. A very crucial one, sending him to the line. Let's watch these free throws. He end up missing the first. See if he can make it a two point game. And he makes that one, so it's 47 to 49 now. Tartan with the ball. Now inbound play, good defense by North, but North, Tartan does get it into Jenkins Whitmore. And he goes straight to the basket. Could have called, been called an and one, but nonetheless, tie ball game now. Now North St. Paul runs an inbound play for Good News Capigle. Clock counting down, 10 seconds to play. You know Good News is gonna take this one to the hoop and try to win this game. He misses, gets his own offensive rebound, goes back up, gets Tartan gets called for the foul. This will send Good News to the line. Now let's watch the free throws. First one is good. 48 to 47 now. Now let's see if he can make this a two point game. Second one goes in. Really got the roll on that one. 49 to 47 now. Now three seconds left to play. Inbounds pass. This one will get up to Kimmins, the best player for Tartan. He puts it up the buzzer. No good. And North St. Paul wins the section four, four A quarterfinals. A huge win for Tartan. Good news, Capigo really stepped up with those free throws in the final seconds. He added eight points to the team score. Let's see if he can tell us about those free throws at the end of the game. You know, uh, I knew God was on my side. I was just trying my best to relax. I know when I relax, I usually make the free throw, so I just took my little deep breath, one dribble, and shot it, and it went in. So when the first game of sections in my senior year, it's great. We just have to, our goal is to make it to state, so. You know, we just we just trying to take it baby by day. This was a big game versus Tartan, and I'm glad we can get the win. Well, our coach preaches it all day that we're not going to always get calls, so we can't down on it. I know my teammates got me even when I come out. We actually went on a run when I was out. You know, we just got to keep grinding and foul trouble, no foul trouble. Our teammates, my teammates, they play great, and I'm sure that we can get the W without me or with me. It doesn't matter. All right, so we'll look back at that Section 4 4A tournament bracket. North St. Paul would go on to lose in the next round against the best team in the state, Creighton Durham Hall, 77 to 63. Creighton Durham Hall still going as they won that section. So good luck to them. I know they're being watched by the Gophers coach, Richard Patino, right now. But folks, we didn't do it last week, but it's time to get to Athletes of the Week. For my male athlete of the week, I have to go with Good News Capigle. Who else? Good News will be graduating high school at North St. Paul this year. He is one of the best players in the state, and he's still left unsigned for college basketball. I know he's going to go on and do big things. He had 17 points in that loss to Creighton, but it only feels right to send him out with this honor as he's been awarded it many times. It's been an honor watching you play. Good luck at the next level, and good luck in your graduation. Now for my female athlete of the week, like good news, I have to go with Emma Grothaus, a player who's won this quite a few times from Matamidi. She's graduating as well and has won this award as a few times. She had 15 points in the Matamidi season finale against De La Salle. So good luck next year at Lehigh University. And that wraps up my Athletes of the Week. All right, folks, we'd like to thank you for tuning in tonight. As you know, check our uh, website for all of our upcoming broadcasts. And the third week of April, we will be having Sports Path. So until next time, we'd like to thank you all here at SEC for tuning in. A lot of bodies in front of them. Ducks it at the half. Holding it out in front of Joe Paradise. No check in for Bartholomew. Polarski the other way. It's a two-on-one. Polarski with Neil. Polarski gets behind. Down in Alexandria. Some numbers the other way. Early chance. Score! Aiden Pearson for Matamidi. He's zipping through center. To the dot. 
He cuts to the edge. They score! Jeff Neal on the rebound. Montevideo has come all the way back. And we have a new...